In this video I would like to show you the current status of my conversion of a Prusa MK4 into a granule printer, because this part of my development work didn't go quite in a straight line either. I choose the Prusa MK4 for several reasons. In addition to the mechanical qualities of the device, the open source philosophy of the manufacturer Prusa is a very important point. FDM printing is so widespread because this technology was developed free of patents and with open documentation by the community, which also applies to my granule extruder. Let's have a look at the advantages of the MK4's hardware. Granule extruders are heavier than printheads for filament printing. The original printhead of the MK4 weighs around 300 grams. While my granule extruder version 5.0 with a NEMA 17 stepper motor and a 5 to 1 gearbox weighs a whooping 520 grams. Initial attempts with a lighter NEMA 14 motor didn't work because this stepper doesn't deliver a sufficient torque. Granule extruder version 5.0 is designed to be as simple as possible. The disadvantage is that the mass distribution is unfavorable. The heavy stepper motor including gearbox is at the top, the nozzle where the molten plastic exits is at the bottom. Overall, the granule extruder is only a little longer than the original Bruiser extruder. The mechanics of the MK4's X-axis is therefore designed for a similar construction. The belt for the drive along the X-axis should ideally run through the center of mass of the extruder, which is not quite the case at the moment. The long design of the extruder results in long levers. The path from the attachment points to the nozzle tip is longer compared to the original printhead. The two guiding rails of the X-axis are a clear advantage because the forces on the printhead are absorbed with less overall bend of the mechanics. The distance to the rods is larger not only along the extruder axis, but also in the direction of the Y-axis, the nozzle should be as close as possible to the two rails. The attachment of the extruder can currently be described as provisional and will definitely get a new design next. When it comes to electronics, the conversion is anything but final too. The original printhead is not located on the left of the X-axis so that it can be replaced quickly, but rather to use the built-in limit switch for the Z-axis. In the Prusa MK4, the height above the print bed is measured using a force sensor that registers a very slight bending of the mechanics as soon as the nozzle tip touches the surface. With this system, the build plate can be measured very precisely, which is definitely an advantage when printing the first layer, another reason why I choose the Bruiser MK4. Since this sensor is integrated into the frame of the original extruder and I didn't want to saw it in half, I ordered corresponding sensors with different value ranges, let's see if I can use them. Since the currently improvised limit switch only measures the height on the far left of the X-axis, by now only prints with a rather small footprint can be made. I designed Extruder 5.0 so that it can be rebuilt with the simplest tool possible, even if that currently means compromises in terms of print quality. I made the tube mainly with my good old drill press. I showed how this can be done better with a lathe in a previous video of this series. In order to center the hole as good as possible, I printed appropriate holders for the brass parts. The upper part is made of an approximately 16mm long thread of an M12 brass screw. As with the previous extruder version 4.1, this part is drilled completely through with a 3mm drill and then with a 6mm drill. Then with a 7mm drill and approximately 2mm deep hole for the connection to the hot end is drilled. 
7 mm deep for the step 4 at the other end. Followed by an 8 mm. And a 9 mm drill. The hot end drill starts with a 3 mm hole. That is widened with a 5 mm drill. And then an M6 thread is cut. From top, half of the hot end is then drilled with a 6mm drill. And about 2mm deep with a 7mm drill. An approximately 9mm long piece of stainless steel tube with an inner diameter of 6mm and an outer diameter of 7mm acts as heat barrier. As you can see the three parts are not perfect. The goal of version 5.0 is to show what can be done with less precisely manufactured parts. The parts of the tube are braced with silver solder. It is important that the three parts line up as perfectly as possible. The central part of the water cooling is printed from PETG. Nothing needs to be soldered here as was the case with the previous model. The components are sealed with Loctite. The Prusa MK4 has an additional temperature sensor at the cold end, which I have not yet implemented in the water cooling system. The hopper is integrated into the screw connection with the 5 to 1 gearbox of the extruder motor. A stainless steel wood screw as shown in the previous video with a diameter of 4.5mm is used as auger. The linkage between the transmission output shaft and the screw is made of drilled round brass. Since my extruder principle requires a large gap between the auger and the tube wall, the screw can rotate freely even if it is not perfectly centered in the stiff coupling. The material is fed through a funnel on the front. Currently by a hand with a spoon. As always, the build instructions with all dimensions and the 3D files of the parts to be printed are available on my website. What is this extremely simple granule extruder good for? Thanks to the compact design of the extruder tube, it does not need to be heated up longer than a normal filament printer. As soon as the desired printing temperature is reached, you can start a job. Since my standard test print is very small at 25 by 27 by 12 mm, the not yet implemented sensor for measuring the build plate is no problem. However, the first layer is still only printed with 15 mm per second on the glass plate. The remaining layers are printed at a speed of 30 mm per second. The layer height is set to 0.2mm and a 0.4mm nozzle is installed in the extruder. The much requested and now finally implemented part cooling fan has a positive impact. The edges on the overhangs no longer bend upwards. 
With this, those edges are printed nice and sharp. The opening at the front of the track link is also significantly better than before. The rigid coupling between the stepper motor and the auger screw works, but with some drawbacks. Due to the slight wobbling of the shaft, the material is not extruded quite as evenly as it could and should be. This is noticeable in rougher outer walls. I will therefore re-implement a flexible coupling that can compensate for the offset of the two shafts. Let's increase the print speed to 60mm per second. The extruder can manage this print speed in collaboration with the MK4 without any significant compromises in terms of print quality. I deactivated the software refinements, pressure advance and input shaping that the Bruiser MK4 offers during the current tests. When it comes to printing tests, it's still important for me to see what the extruder can deliver without interference from the printer firmware. So let's speed up to 120mm per second. I increased the acceleration values to 4000mm per second square in order to actually be able to reach the speeds. The print quality visibly decreases, there are good reasons why slicing programs automatically reduce the acceleration and print speed values for such small structures. But I just wanted to see whether the extruder could go from zero to maximum extrusion and back to zero so quickly without creating gaps in the walls or just printing a mishappen mess. Apparently it works not too bad. So now the speed is set to 200mm per second. Here too, the 2mm thin walls of the track link are printed without long cracks or gaps. However, the surface becomes increasingly uneven and the part cooling fan can no longer prevent the overhangs from bending up. The unfavorable leverage of the improvised attachment to the X-axis causes the nozzle to jump over the surface from time to time, causing gaps in the outer wall. The moisture bound in the granules also causes problems as the material throughput increases. Vapor bubbles are another reason for small gaps in the surface. Surprisingly, even with these settings, a track link is printed that can in principle still be recognized as such and could certainly be used. The close-ups of the prints show the weak points of the extruder and the improvised attachment to the Bruiser MK4 that still need to be addressed. 
All in all, this rule of thumb construction already produces surprisingly good prints, but I will be switching to 20th century manufacturing methods in the near future in order to bring the print quality even closer to that of existing filament printers. If you would like to support me financially in my efforts to develop a really practical granule extruder for desktop printers, in addition to the build instructions and further information about the project, there is also a donate button on my pages. A big thank you to my anonymous major sponsor and to all the other great people who have already sent me an obel. More components for the conversion of the Prusa MK4 have already been ordered spending the money, so things will continue soon. Thanks for watching and I'll be back.